so that in case in case some of you want to go back uh, and and look at uh, refer back to the session right i'll post this in the google classroom please note google classroom is going to be the main platform by which we are going to uh, exchange information and upload materials so um just a few things to uh, to mention before i pass the the microphone huh? You don't see past the floor, right? Past the microphone to, uh, to Father Dr. Lawrence. Okay. One is, uh, as usual, please keep your mics on mute so that we don't disrupt the session. If you have a question, Father, are you okay with them asking you a question uh, as you're presenting? Okay. Uh, as you're presenting, you are, you need a question, please. Uh, uh, you can put out, you know, there's an icon, a hand icon. If not, you just say, Father, uh, may I ask a question? And then... Matthew is not here. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, then also, um, Father, uh, Father and I have discussed the format for the day, beginning uh, from 9 to 4. I believe wow. Father will also be, uh, may have his own uh, uh, format. Uh, he may give you maybe some questions, group discussions. We leave that to Father. And also, uh, at the end, I will also give you the the reminders, some of the reminders that we need to keep. And as I've said earlier, unless and until, uh, until unless you go into the CCC and start reading it, okay, the whole purpose of this course is that you will use the CCC. Don't wait for us, the presenters or lecturers to, I use the word spoon feed, enough for spoon feeding, right? We need to, you need to dive into the CCC. And our role is just give you Hold on, I think there's a sound coming from somewhere. Okay. Uh, our role is to ensure that, please mute your mic, sir, if you don't mind. Our role is to give you the, the directions, uh, lead you in the right directions, okay? All right. So, we'll, uh, we'll begin with a prayer. Unless, Father, would you like to lead us in the prayer, Father? Um, no, please okay. go ahead. I will lead you in a prayer this morning. And... Uh, and uh, let's always remember, uh, let's always remember, this, all this is not, we do not want it to be just human effort on human initiative or human endeavor. It has to be, uh, it, you must, we must realize it is about God and about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is our true teacher, teaches us what Jesus has taught us. So it's important that we keep this in mind. Always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, thank you so much for the gift of this beautiful day. Thank you for watching over us and protecting us and our loved ones throughout the night. And thank you for the many blessings you have given to us, even from the time that we awoke until now. Father, help us to look around us and to see the blessings that you give us so freely each day. Even though, even here, as we gather in the name of Jesus over the Zoom link, this too is a blessing. Thank you for the blessing of Reverend Dr. Lawrence Ng has given his time and his expertise to share his knowledge with us. Thank you for the gift of him. Thank you for the gift of each one of us whom you have created in your image and likeness and whom you have called to be part of this journey that we want to make so that your people are nourished, your people are knowledgeable, your people draw closer to you. Thank you, Father for all our family members whom we have to set aside this time. Thank you for their understanding that we are here because we want to do something that is important. We pray also for, thank you also, Lord, for all our parish priests and our Archbishop. And most of all, thank you for Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, in whose name we journey in this course. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so without much ado, I would like to introduce Father Lawrence Kern. 
Um, I, I know Father Lawrence for many years. I won't say from where. Okay, that's for me uh, uh, an old story. But I know Father Lawrence for many years. Um, and I, uh, he's a nice person. I worked with him also. In fact, we met a few days ago for a meeting. Um, I asked him for biodata, but as I said, he's a very humble man. So, uh, he, you know, he didn't want to give me a long biodata. So what I'll do is I'll pass the floor to Father, I'll pass the mic to Father Lawrence, and and hope that he will give us a nice introduction about himself before he starts the session. So over to you, Father Reverend Doctor Lawrence. Thank you, Doctor Stephen. It is very rarely that I get called Doctor in so many, uh, so many times within the span of five minutes, um, and um, I feel honored. You know, I've been a priest for uh, I'm from the diocese of Nakajobo. I've been a priest for about twenty years now, uh, twenty one years this year, and. Um, I oh are we having some music along the way? Sure. I left for the states in two zero one four, uh, to do or rather to pursue my studies in systematic theology. I think that I did well, or at least I think I did well. My professor recommended me and says, why don't I consider doing the continue and complete it with the doctorate, right? So then I asked my bishop, I just wrote, you know, just trying my luck, just, right? And uh, to my surprise, the diocese approved me uh, doing my doctorate. Uh, by the first, second year of me in the process of doing my doctorate uh, uh, or my doctoral studies or in my doctoral program, uh, I began to regret because uh, STL, doing the licensure and master's in systematic theology was already difficult enough. And then when you do the uh, doctorate, uh, wow. Yeah. And this is not to blow my own horn, but studies in the States, especially graduate studies, are not easy. The professors are really uh, strict, uh, especially if it is the Jesuit School of Theology that is part of the uh, Santa Clara Uni University uh, in Berkeley. Uh, there is two posts of theological school, at least uh, in the States. One is in Berkeley, where I am, and then one in Boston. The one in Boston, many of you studied there, claims to be more academic and more upper class, you know. Um, and the more liberal, uh, the more grounded one would be Berkeley. So that is where I came. I graduated. Uh, with a doctorate uh, in 2021, right? And I've been back since. I thought I would be doing more theological studies and that was the plan. But such as it is, uh, that didn't work out, the, you know, because I think that there's a shortage of priests and we need to do whatever that needs to be done. So I'm the currently the parish priest of uh, Church of Divine Mercy in Skudai. I'm also the chancellor of the diocese and among other things, uh, kind of jack of all trades. So then the theological studies is something that I don't really get to do, uh, or rather to, uh, teaching. So this is very rare opportunity for me to be able to teach. Um, I am not able to prepare this for this class as best as I can because of the, the, the work uh, that, that I, I also have. But my style is always uh, the seminar style. I will present and we will go through the text of this uh, CCC. Uh, my style is I invite conversations. I invite dialogue. The important thing is let us be respectful of one another's views, right? And we know the foundation of our faith. But uh, I also invite critical thinking. Uh, and if you disagree or if you have different opinion, uh, or you have some other insights to to add, please do so, right? But uh, let us remember not to, well, drag on. So without uh, going further, I think that is enough of an introduction, uh, right, uh, Dr. Stephen, and I will just continue uh, with the lesson. So then uh, if you want to speak, 
right? Uh, just unmute. Uh, I don't see all the screens. I suppose if you put your hand up, the thing will appear here, is it? Uh, just screen will immediately appear. I will see them. Is that correct? Uh, who will be the one to answer me? Uh, no. Can you see my raised hand, Doctor? Uh, oh, no. oh, oh, yeah. If you raise hand, oh, then you'll be there. Okay, that, that's great. Uh, and then the um, groups are prepared, right? Uh, groups of uh, five each. Uh, what we'll do, uh, Father, is that when the when we're going to go have the breakout groups, we will the we will, uh, system will help us to allocate the the, mem the people in the group. Okay, uh, so let us begin with uh, an open discussion. Now we are looking at this text and I will begin to share screen uh, with what I have. Okay, this is it. Uh, can... Can everybody see this clearly? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Let me see if I maximize the screen. Is it better? Oh no. Ah. Oh, then we can enlarge this, right? See? Ah, uh, sorry, is it possible to oh sorry, sorry. I need to zoom from here. I forgot that I'm working with two screens. Okay, this is a lot better, right? I think. Yes, yes. yes okay, Father. I I like to uh, begin. Sorry, Father. Uh, I hope everyone has got your CCC in front of you, huh? Please. Yes, this is yes. important. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Father. Carry oh, on. Yes, I'm pro I'm proceeding with the assumption that everybody has read your CCC, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, yeah. Uh, the ideal is, of course, before the class, you read your text. Uh, the, the thing not to do is to read your text uh, after the class, right? I think the we are influenced by the Asian style of, of uh, pedagogy. That is, uh, we go to class first and then the teacher tells us what to read. Sometimes the teacher don't even tell us what to read, just give us notes, right? But I've uh, learned a different method in the style that you are already prepared when you go to class. That means you read all your assigned material and then you can have conversations. Then you won't proceed along blindly. Uh, it is not so much that we have questions. Uh, it, is, it is more important uh, to know uh, the questions to ask rather than to just have questions so that our academic curiosity is not a shot in the dark. It's not blind, you know. It, it, it is moving forward with a direction within a certain framework and that will come from your reading. So having said that, I just uh, begin with a discussion and I do not know whether this will be successful uh, in uh, here over Zoom. My experience of teaching is always in class and actually never this big. It, it's always what I think the biggest will be around 20. Uh, that is about the size of the the uh, ac academic, uh, the limit for students, they don't take more than 20, sometimes 25. So I want to begin with this uh, statement. Faith is subjective. Faith is, is subjective. Uh, do you agree or disagree? Uh, maybe let us hear for, from a few uh, and tell me what you think. Well, just take a minute to think about it. Faith is subjective. Okay. Yes. If you have question uh, from my question, please ask me. But I think that it may be clear now. Faith is subjective. Father, do you mean that my idea of faith might differ from your idea of faith? Possible, possible. 
Okay. Because when we say subjective, right? Uh, what does it mean? It means that it's filtered and comes from our own experience, right? Yes. It, okay, one we have answered yes, Rosalind. Yes, it depends on each one's experience uh, to God. Situation, okay. All right. Yes, I, I agree Any... too, Father. I agree that faith is subjective because um, my faith is um, is not only um, it's, it's not only from my learning about God, but also very much influenced by the faith teaching of my parents and all. So, of course, definitely it will be different for each person. And my level of faith is also um, definitely different from others because the number of times I fail, I fall, can be different from another person. This is my point of view. Uh, Thank you. I would yes. say no, no, faith is not subjective because it is a gift from God. And and maybe our experience of faith is subjective, but faith itself is not subjective. Well, um, thank you. I just have another question to add. But where does faith come from? <laughs> uh, just just a thing. Just a thing. Uh, I, uh, few few more contributions before we proceed. Hi, good morning, Father. Vernon here from Olok. Yes, Vernon. Hello, Vernon. Okay, uh, for me, it's a yes, I agree. Uh, faith is subjective because uh, we cannot prove it through uh, any science research or anything. It, in the other words, uh, we can say that it's a very qualitative instead of quantitative. So, yeah, it's subjective and I agree with the rest that uh, it based on our experience and what we have uh, gone through. Yeah, that's that's my take on this, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I think I have a different view, Father. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes. I think I think faith is objective. There is a reality out there, regardless of whether I have personally experienced it or not. So in that sense, I think it is objective. Mm. Good morning, Father. Hello, sister. Yes. Uh, for me, I think faith is uh, subjective also because mm -hmm. it depends on personal and sub the, based on the uh, personal experience, varying from person to person based on beliefs, values, and also individual perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Uh, it's very interesting to hear all of you give your opinions. You all artic articulate your your ideas very well. Uh, perhaps one or two more, if there's anybody. No, by Hello, Father. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Salva here. Uh, I believe that faith is our belief in God and our conversation in God. And that's how we grow. Thank you. Uh, hello, Father Ellen here. Mm. Uh, I believe faith is subjective because it requires us to believe in something. To me, objective is something like objectively this, this table and I'm at is a wooden table. You believe or you don't believe it is a wooden table. But faith requires us to also believe. So it's subjective. And where does faith come from? It comes from your willingness to believe in the faith. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Um, I, I must confess that I'm not really very honest with you all. It's a bit of a trick question, right? Uh, so the uh, thank you for your answers. Now, um, faith is... Hmm. Faith has both dimension, right? Um, it is sure, it is subjective. It begins and comes from us. But then it is objective in a sense that there is the object of our faith, right? Now, when you talk about 
uh, what comes from the human experience uh, when we talk about uh, between subjective and objective, we are talking about something that comes from within and talking the reality as it is, right? The object, uh, faith is faith is always directed towards something. And in this sense, faith is directed, the object of our faith is God, right? Uh, now, that is where it gets tricky. And this is a problem for all ages, uh, right? Um, the object of our faith is God. And God is a, God is a reality. Uh, it, God is a reality um, that, that we are direct towards it, uh, towards to. And the, the foundation of our, the object of our faith comes from this uh, scripture and tradition that comes from revelation that is really experienced uh, throughout the history of salvation. First uh, in the Old Testament and now in the New Testament, uh, in the early, uh, the people of Israel uh, fulfilled in Christ. And once upon a time in history, there is this person, Jesus, who walked uh, upon the earth, right? And Jesus is, is a person that is recorded in, in history as somebody who was crucified. Ah, the object of our faith, um, the, the, uh, so while this may be true, but then the lead to make into the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, that is that that is a leap. That is why they call it a leap of faith. So then you will notice that you know that faith is not knowledge in the ordinary sense, right? Faith is not knowing in the ordinary sense. Uh, faith, uh, when you know something, uh, some one or two of you pointed out, you know something that is an objective reality. For example, when you look at this, right? Uh, I know. I know the measurement of my table is six feet because I have this, right? It is something that is within my sense perception, within my eyes, within my measurement, and within my understanding and knowing, right? But faith brings you into a reality that is that is mystery. Faith brings you into a reality that that is of God, a transcendent reality, right? And it is this reality that has been given to us in continuity by the church. And what we have here, right, when we say, I believe, uh, we believe, uh, it really tells us about the nature of faith, right? Um, that our faith is expressed within a personal dimension, but faith is also within a communitarian, communi communitarian level, right? So then we can't narrow down faith because just to understand the element of faith itself is it, so wide, so vast, right? I've always thought that Jesus uh, was being funny when he says, uh, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, right, you can say to this tree, uh, be uprooted and plant to yourself. But it is this element that we have that you, that you may claim subjective, right, that brings us into this communitarian aspect that brings us into this community, that brings us into this class, that really has shaped the way we live our, our life within the tradition of the Catholic Church, right? Because this is what uh, this book is really trying to tell us. It brings us and tells us within the context of faith. So what you, what you notice here is that, um, is that faith, Faith is a response to God, right? So then this objective uh, transcendent mystery, uh, which can only be grasped by the act of faith, uh, is our response to God. God has revealed. God has revealed. Um, and to the revelation of God, right? Uh, it is met by the uh, a response of faith a response of obedience, a response of love. When you look at this, uh, the CCC uh, put us first into this context. Right? That uh, there is something in this, uh, there is something in this chapter 
that is really interesting uh, within when when you consider 27 to 30 uh, 20, uh, paragraph 27 to paragraph 13 right there is two things i find that is uh, interesting right um, that that really tells us something about uh, the human person uh, do do any of you want to take a step uh, those of you who have read at least the desire for God, there are two things that, well, for me, uh, it tells us something very interesting. Anybody want to take a step and tell me something about what you find uh, revealing about the, um, this first section, the desire for God? Uh, Father Trevlin, from assumption, is the dignity of man. That's right, right? It tells us something of the dignity of the human person. But it doesn't just rest there. What does it tell us? That the dignity of uh, the human person rests above all that he is called to communion with God. Right? So then there is this offer. There is this offer from God. God's love, uh, God's invitation is extended to, to us. Right? And we it is as if here it says that we come to the fullness of who we are when uh, we respond to this fact that we are in communion with God. That our dignity lies in the fact that we are called to communion with God. We who come from God can only uh, go to God. That is why uh, we are called a religious being. Right? Uh, it is something that we tell God never ceases to call every human person in paragraph 30 uh, to seek God so as to find life and happiness. But then, but then, um, when we see the desire for God, right, is this desire for God limited only to, is this desire for God limited only to us Catholics? Is this desire of God limited to us only uh, now, Christians, what all about people mankind. Of, of all mankind, right? What about people then? Then, if this there is this desire for God, and that we are this religious being, then how does that explain? Uh, how does that explain? Uh, how does that explain uh, other religions? There is something. Maybe let me put it this way. There is something common about um, the great religions of the world. What are the great religions of the world? Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam. Islam right? Uh, there is something common among all the great religions of the world. Trying to explain our experience or our assistance while you are here. Yeah. Maybe like St. Augustine says, we are restless until our hearts rest in him. So every religion or every person have that kind of desire or longing for something yeah. unknown. We don't know. We know that there's something out there. So it doesn't matter you're Christian or non-Christian. There's, there's yeah. something working in us. I just feel, yeah, that's our faith. The only thing is, how are we going to reach this unknown? Okay, sorry. I just let me see if I can do this. Um, this uh, share more than one screen. Uh, does it work? Only Jesus says he is, uh, is the truth and he is revealed. The other religion doesn't say the truth, that Jesus is the truth. Uh, can you see this screen that I, uh, the white screen? Yes, we I'll can see the yes, white Yes, Father. Yes, okay, sorry. Okay. So the, that is the thing that is interesting, right? There is this uh, assumption that man, man's capacity from God. Uh, I'm sorry I should have prepared all of this in PowerPoint, but there were just too many slides that I could never complete it. Right, so the assumption is that we are all we are all religious beings, 
right? The assumption is that our hearts, that we are directed, we feel a sense of drawn. Drawn to God. Drawn to God, right? So, uh, what is what is what is in common among all the great religions? Now, it is not enough to be a religious being. We have been a religious being since the time of uh, since the time when we were cavemen, right? One of the one of the sure ways of indication that we are a religious being is how when we bury our dead, right? I mean, uh, it is interesting that we bury our dead. And we just don't bury our dead. There is this religious and ritualistic aspect that goes around uh, burying our dead in all cultures throughout the years, throughout the history of humankind. Right? There is some what is called the anim animistic sense, um, the primordial sense uh, of, of this reaching out. So we we, we worship trees. We 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 uh, worship oceans, we worship fire, you know, there is all the elements. But what, what is the difference that is given by all the great religions of the world? That only in the great religion of the world gives us an, an avenue to reach out for the or is that the correct spelling? To reach out for the transcendent Sorry, wrong spelling. Yeah. Luckily got uh, luckily got. Okay. Father, can I say that all the religion, the common thing is that all religion calls its believers to be in communication with God, in relationship with God through prayer? Uh yes, yes. That is what I mean, right? There is the idea of the transcendent. So even though I share this part, but it is good to know that, at least be aware that we are not the only one that offers what this uh, Sri Lankan theologian called the metacosmic, right? The avenue to reach out to the transcendent. So all successful religion would have that, right? And uh, this is what we have. We just don't have faith, right? Our faith leads us to, our faith leads us out. Our faith leads us to transcend. And, but this is the teaching of the Catholic Church. That our faith, um, our ability, our, our desire to transcend, to seek the transcendent can be met because it is this transcendent who has reached out to us. That is why you have the very beautiful uh, uh, phrase in uh, paragraph 30. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Because God never ceases to call every person who seek God so as to find life and happiness. Right, but then there is something. Uh, uh, so far, I hope everybody is okay. So then we have this uh, faith, right? Faith looks. Uh, faith is directed towards the object of our faith. Uh, we have faith, but that is the object of our faith, and the object of faith is the mystery of God, is the transcendent, right? Um, but uh, it just is not blind searching. Right, so then it tells you ways of coming to God. Right, so then it gives you, uh, but very beautifully, uh, the Catholicism or the Catholic Church put us in the context of our identity, created in God's image and called to know uh, and love Him. Uh, the human person seeks God. The pers the person who seeks God discover certain ways of coming to know him, right? These are, so then there are many ways, right? Uh, you can look from the world, the beauty that is the world. You, you recognize the beauty. Maybe you stand at the Grand Canyon and you saw such beauty with the sunset and you say, there must be a God. This beauty uh, point me to God. Or we look at the human person in paragraph 33, with his openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness. You know, Karl Rahner uh, said something very interesting about how uh, we know God is working within us. Does anybody know this? Uh, he says, 
when we strive to be better, when we strive to be transcend uh, beyond ourselves, when we strive to transcend our pettiness, our uh, our our unforgiveness, our our little little world, when we seek to be better, that is the Holy Spirit at work. Well, that's Carl Runner, right? Um, right. Um, okay. Now, from here, it gives you ways of knowing God. But this is interesting, right? Because uh, then uh, we first discover, we, we say that faith is subjective, right? But then, uh, can I also say uh, this phrase? This word, faith is um, faith is contextual, or faith is conditional. What are your opinions? Can I say this faith? Right, faith is. Agree or disagree? Agree, Father. Because we what? are to believe in only one God in one faith and not to pray to other gods. We are to love only one God as he has loved us. Thank you. One or two more? Oh, it's, it is already 9.40, eh? Let's time very fast. Oh, but we, we have this class until 10 15, right? Okay, okay. Yes. Agree. Uh, perhaps you can qualify when you share. Yes, uh, that would be great if you can. Yes, agree. It's conditional because it very much depends on whether we seek God or not. If we if we just lie around and stay around and say, you know, we have faith, but we don't really go and attend. Uh, really get to know him better, like coming for us as this CCC, then you know we would not be able to know him or be able to love him. Okay, so very good, lah. You know, uh, I don't really need uh, Doctor Stephen. I don't really need to teach this class anymore. Uh, everybody seems to be able to get it right. Uh, <laughs> Carry on, Doctor Reverend. So, uh, so it is true, right? What you say. Faith is contextual. Faith is conditional. So then, our faith is just not blind faith, right? You just don't believe anything and anything. We believe our faith is taken in, in the form and is expressed within the creed of the church, right? Within the teachings of the church. That is why uh, we go, that is why we have our foundations of our faith on, on this creed, right? Uh, in, the, in that sense, uh, theology, is it is conditional is contextual we ex we can grow as big as we want in our faith within the boundaries that is set by the teachings of the catholic church within our uh within uh within the creed that we pro pro uh, within the creed that we we recite every sunday right so then uh our faith uh is expressed within the community of the Catholic Church, correct, um, that we accept by our baptism. Okay, very good. Uh, sister must have some training in, in theology, right? So now, uh, there is one part of uh, there is one part here that is that I want to 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 share. Okay. So then, what it really tells us is this: God has revealed, right? Uh, we respond in faith, in obedience, in surrender. But when we come to worship, when we come to worship uh, God. Right, uh, worship is really an act of surrender. It is this surrendering to this God that we believe, 
that is something that is interesting. Then, uh, if we say that faith is conditional, that this conditional is just not something that is said uh, blindly by the Catholic Church, right? Because it really comes within the article that is expressed here in 51, 51 to, uh, to 66. Oh, sorry. Wait. Fifty-one to sixty-six, right? So then there is something that is interesting uh, that is said here, but that God has a divine plan. That what we believe it is something that is taught to us by God, and this involves what is what the CCC very interestingly put in paragraph fifty-five as a divine. Divine pedagogy. God communicates and teaches us over the years at our own level within our within our ability to accept, within our ability to understand. Right? So when you see this, God reveals his uh, loving goodness. Like God reveals uh, his loving plan of goodness, right? It is a plan that takes through the ages. It is just not, it is just not standardly. God comes out of God, God comes out of darkness, or so to speak. God comes out of silence and reached out to men. There is one definition of the Bible that uh, the Father Francis Anthony, our former lecturer, always like to say. And he always says, and he says as, as, uh, what is the definition of the Bible? Somebody wants to, do somebody want to try to give me? Anybody? Definition of Bible is a collection of books. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, not exactly what I was looking for. What is the definition of the Bible? Basic instruction before leaving Earth. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, not exactly uh, what I was looking Divine for. Revelation. Thank you. Divine revelation. Divine revelation. Right? Uh, closer, closer. Closer. It, though I say it's from Father Francis Anthony, but it is something that is quite common uh, that we hear when people describe uh, the Bible. Uh, word, word of God, sure. God's word is Jesus. Sure. Word of God, Jesus revealed. The word, written word of God. Salvation timeline. Wow, very good, very good. Uh, any Anybody else? Uh, who else on the try? So the you can see... The of himself. Closer, God. closer. God communicating with his people. Very good. You have got the keyword, right? God communicating with his people. Right? That's pretty much it, right? It's really the self, the self, The self-communication of God, inviting, inviting, agree or disagree? Agree, Father. So when you see the Bible as the self-communication of God, inviting the person to respond then it's just not a book right it's not something you just put in the altar then it is something what the ccc will call repeatedly over the next session as the living word of god as the dynamic uh, word of god there is something to be lived there's something that is continually revealing to us 
something that does doesn't happen once and for all. You know, uh, I know that we, we good Catholics like to put our Bible at the altar, right? Uh, then you put there, and 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 uh, we maybe with candles with all the other cross and you know. Then once a month, when you have your BC or every two three months, you take the Bible, you, you blow it the dust, right? You know, uh, because if you're going to have BC meeting, people are going to come. You don't want the people to know that well, the, the dust is this thick, right? When you do that, well, it doesn't really become the living word of God because the power of the word of God is is home within us when we when we read it when we live it. So then. The Bible really tells us the stages of the self-communication of God, the revelation that happens along the way, right? So God reveals His loving kindness, that there is a plan, that God has ex extended God's self, right? And God communicates gradually. So we, we have, right, in the stages of revelation, we have in the stages of revelation, a story that God is beginning to make God's self known. Right, the the covenant that takes place with Noah. Right, all this tells us something. How many covenants do we have, by the way? Do you all know? We have three covenants. Uh, well, close. Uh, what are the covenants? The first covenant with Adam. The second, oh no. Uh, with Noah, with Abraham, and with Jesus, through Jesus. So, uh, that there is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Noah, the Abrahamic, the covenant, Mosaic, well, Moses, the, Mosaic, the Davidic, Mosaic, and then Jesus, the Mosaic, and then Jesus, right? Uh, the Davidic, there's also one more with, with Moses, then David, and then with Jesus. What about the covenant with Adam? The Adamic covenant? Is yeah, yeah. A... yeah, yeah. That, that was already counted. That was number one. I, I, don't, I don't remember the Adamic covenant. Uh, I, tell me about it. Who, who can tell me about it? Uh, that was, well, this is according to Scott Hahn. Uh, the Ooh. covenant between God and Adam. He told Adam to till the earth and uh, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, okay. So anyway, in theologically, uh, history of salvation as I learned it, I remember there's the Abrahamic, uh, the Noah, uh, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, and the covenant with um, uh, Moses, Moses, and the covenant with uh, David, Jesus. Uh, why I don't mention all that is because only these places are. Um, are a contract that God enters with, with the people, right? Um, a, a covenant, you know, a covenant like, for example, the covenant of Moses, I shall be your God, you shall be my people. But notice one thing, that is the point that I want to make with this, that each covenant, God reveals to us as, as much as we can take it. The covenant with Noah, uh, the covenant with Abraham, uh, Noah is simple. Uh, the covenant with uh, Abraham uh, is be faithful. The covenant with uh, Moses uh, extends to the people and says, um, I shall be your God and you shall be my people. And then finally, uh, the covenant with Jesus, I do this in memory of me. Um, that by Jesus, you know, uh, the that we come to know God and we will, we will worship God in spirit and in truth, right? These are all the stages of revelation, right? And finally, when it comes, uh, so in the end, uh, Jesus is the fullness of revelation. That's why it tells us that all God wants to say uh, is all said in, in, in Jesus, uh, mediator and fullness of revelation. Now, before I go into this, uh, why? Why is it the teaching of the church? And we can see very definitively that Jesus is the fullness of all revelation. That there is no more revelation after Jesus. Within the context of what you have read here in the CCC. Uh, 
Why? Himself. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, because Stephanie. Jesus is, because Jesus is God himself. So when he came and told us about himself, there would be no other revelation after him. Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, it, 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 it's, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Jesus is God himself. You are right. Um, what else? What else? Uh, within the context of what we, we, we read about the revelation of God, the self-revelation of God. So this is a story of God revealing God's self. And it is true. Uh, there is this coming of Jesus. God the giver uh, has himself become the gift. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. So there is no more to, to uh, say. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, Oh wait, uh, was this in my question? Uh, sorry, uh, let me check. Let me check. Uh, I prepared uh, questions for you all. Let me check whether it's this question that I want to give you all. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, why? Why is this? Um, why is Jesus the fullness of revelation within the context of what you've read? Right? There is the God's reveal God's plan, right? And uh, God makes himself known. And this plan is expressed uh, throughout um, the history of salvation that is we see with, with uh, Noah, with Abraham. In fact, the history, God's plan really becomes definite with Abraham. With Abraham, God made a definite plan and said, you go leave your country, right? And you'll become the father of multitude of nations. In you, all the nations of the earth, earth shall be blessed, right? And then God continues to this plan and then God had Moses and make a covenant and say, be faithful to my covenant and I shall be your God and you shall be my people, right? And this, we have the uh, Israel becoming a nation and then the prophets coming out, reminding the people, come back, come back to me with all your heart, right? Though your sins are like scarlet, uh, yeah, and yet the people stayed away and people lost and then the exile happened. Right, then the exile came back, they became the poor of the poor of the Lord, people whose life is dependent on God. Right. So this is a little bit of the gist of the salvation. And then suddenly come to Jesus. Right. Uh, many of you have said close to it. Uh, why is Jesus? Father. Is it Para sixty five? Para sixty five. Ah. Christ, the Son of God, made man, is the Father's one and perfect, unsurpassable Word. In Him, He has said everything. There is no other word than this one. And then we continue the second paragraph. In giving His Son His only Word, He possesses no other. He spoke everything to us, as at in his soul word, and he has no more to say. Because yes. he spoke before the prophets in parts, he has now spoken all at once by giving us all who is his son. Okay, very, very good. Okay, thank you. So now, um, in this part, uh, to answer this question, it, it, it is really this. Uh, what is the purpose of revelation? Who is it for? Well, for me, is to, to have a relationship. Yes, to have a relationship. To communicate with God. To have a relationship, yeah. That is correct, more or less along the lines of what I'm thinking of. What is the purpose of revelation? To show that God is real. To show that God is real. God reveals himself to show that he is real. God reveals is... himself to show that God yeah. is real, right? Yeah. We still want us to know him because he created us. He wants us to know him. Yeah. So he has to reveal himself. Yes. To get the us from us. To help us live more fully in him. Yeah. 
And of course, he wants us to worship him, eh, to give him praise. He had created us for that, eh? Isaiah 43, 21. He formed us so that we can praise him. We need to know him. This, uh, let me ask you another way. Uh, uh, let me ask you all another way. When God reveals God's self, uh, what does God reveal about? Like, of course, His nature. God. Uh, God reveals God's nature, but there's really something, a uh, purpose of it, right? God is really telling something about something. His will. His uh, will, correct, correct. But uh, again, like to what end? Uh, to his plan to bring to us all plan. back. It's God's plan for salvation. Yeah, so then to bring us then, all back to him. Love, oh, love. No. Answer but, is but, but is it true? Is revelation all about God or is revelation all about who? Yes. He's us, right? about is it? ourselves. About ourselves. So revelation, rather than reveal God, he, it, it reveals, it reveals uh, who God is for us in relation to us. Right? Uh, because what God really tells us is really who we are, our identity, who, where we come from, where we are going, the revelation of God is really directed about the part of us, uh, the, the part of us, we as, as um, we as God's creation that has become conscious. You know, uh, when you look at, uh, when you look at paragraph 39 to 42, right? Right? It tells us something about God who has created us, how we come from God, right? And that and that what God revealed to us is always in relation to us. Because beyond that, beyond revelation, what, what can we really know about God as God? Can we know God as God? No. No, right? Why? Why no? Why can we not know God as God? His wisdom and ours are not the same. And we cannot understand. His ways of thoughts are not ours. It's yes. far, it's far away. God is a transcendent mystery, right? God is beyond us. So then we appreciate the story and the beauty of Revelation, right? That God reveals to us in relation to ourselves so that we know who we are. That in this faith that we have, uh, it is a faith that brings us this connection with the divine, right? That is why Jesus is the last and the fullness of revelation. Because if we take the premise and accept that, we understand God in relation to ourselves. We understand God uh, through the actions of Jesus that is really directed to us. So if God who has revealed God's self uh, about who we are, about what we need, uh, what we need to do to respond to God's will, and how we are saved in God, and finally all this that is revealed in Jesus, then is there any more new revelation that is needed? So, so now if God has revealed God's self, right? I, I hope you all are be able, uh, you are able to follow me. Right? Is now God has revealed, then finally there is Jesus. So after Jesus comes a new era. No longer this no longer this um, this this uh, history of salvation that we have after after Jesus uh, we have a new era. Jesus is the fullness of revelation. No new revelation. Uh, there is a question later on to ask you, right? Uh, for your for your work group, right? But now we're talking about the trans. Now after Jesus, the age of the transmission of divine revelation. So after Jesus, we call. Is always the age of what? The age of start with the word E. Eternity. So yeah, uh, go baptize. Uh, go baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of and of the Holy Spirit. This is the last one of Jesus, right? So after Jesus, it's always uh, is the age of the evangelizations. Is the age of evangelization. Oh, very good, Rosalind. Uh, uh, Alex was a little bit one second earlier uh, in mentioning it, right? It's the age of evangelization. So with that, we have the transmission of divine revelation. 
you have the apostolic tradition, we have the opos uh, the krigma, the apo apostolic preaching, we have the writing of the Bible, the con the continue in the apostolic succession, right? And then, and then, and then, uh, within all this, um, we have uh, the relationship between tradition and and scripture. There is one one phrase that is that is used here that I wanted to okay to to know with a whole on. Huh? Okay. Right. Um, now the I I want to I wanted to ask you all what is the difference between tradition and sacred scripture? But even for theologians, it is not an easy um, uh, easy uh, question to answer. Uh, but, uh, but I can ask it this way: When was the when is the Bible as you have it compiled? Like when did the church really have the Bible? Like when the church fathers who who did this script, did they have the Bible already by then? As we know it in this form. All right. The Bible, uh, I think was the Council of Constantinople. I can't remember the year. I'm talking about the canon of the Bible, which is uh, around about around 300 AD. But the Bible really became a Bible when? Around the 3rd and 4th century, right? They didn't have Bible in the early church. Why? They relied on tradition. So there is tradition. There is the uh, orally, and thank you, Rosary, but not everybody was illiterate, lah, right? Uh, but uh, when it was translated to the when it was translated to the it has to be translated right the first Wait. bible is uh, you're talking about saint jerome to, when it was translated to the latin vulgate right yeah that was in jerome in the fourth century Right. So then, in in the beginning, we don't really have a, we don't have really the Bible as we as we see now, right? It, it is a collection of books uh, that has been put uh, and decided by the the by the church uh, really in the second to the fourth century, right? Uh, by the church, right? So then, so then, if you have the scripture, scripture, then we have the tradition, right? The tradition that is the apostles. The tradition, as uh, Kong, the, the, the theologian Yish Kong Gao tells us, tradition completes uh, the scripture, right? So then it, it moves hand in, in hand. We have the sacred scripture, and then we have tradition, right? Uh, so then, uh, then we come to the final point that I want to make. In page, uh, there is something that is that is um, that is that is uh, interesting in paragraph 84 what do you see there in paragraph 84 that is interesting a word that is used after vatican 2 sacred deposit Yes, the deposit of faith, right? Right. So that because we have because we have the revelation, and then we have the uh, Jesus, and then we have the age of evangelization, the age of the apostles and the traditions that is passed on, right? All this, all this. <coughs> become the <coughs> all this becomes the deposit <coughs> all this becomes the deposit of faith that is handed on 
right, through generations and we adhere and we are faithful to this teaching. And because we have the deposit of faith, then we can understand the role of the magisterium, right? The authentic interpretation uh, to the word of God, right? It is not uh, superior to the word of God. It is his servant, so to speak. It listens. He guards it with dedication, right? All that he proposed for belief as divinely revealed is drawn from this single deposit of faith, from the one God. So friends, uh, if there is no questions, uh, there is no time for group work. Um, uh, sorry, I, I assume that is the question. Yeah, are there anything to ask before I send you all off for a little bit of work? Brother, uh, para 88 eh? on dogmas. Yes. Uh, the, so the dogmas are a translation of the uh, deposit of faith, is it? The dogmas, dogmas are the authoritative teaching uh, of the church. It clearly, it clearly, it clearly defines the content of faith, right? So we have faith, but we just don't have faith. Our faith is conditional and contextual. Is expressed within the teachings of the Catholic Church, right? But what are the teachings of the Catholic Church? The content of it uh, is uh, the boundary that is given, right? We, we call it dogma. That means these are official statements, right? Anybody and ev everybody can make statement about Jesus Christ, right? But then what is the dogma we have about Jesus Christ that is found in our creed as um, as a uh, professed by the Council of uh, Chalcedon that Jesus Christ is through God and through man. Through God and through man yeah. okay. uh, that will be a dogma. right? So then we will work within our understanding of Jesus within this, uh, this, this understanding of faith, uh, within, this under within this dogma that gives us the boundary of our belief. right? Because you know, because when we tend to spiritualize it, when we tend to spiritualize it, uh, Jesus Christ is everything, right? Jesus Christ is my father. Jesus Christ is my mother. Jesus Christ is my brother. Jesus Christ is my lover. Jesus Christ. Anybody with anybody who can say that, right? I know that a theologian, uh, I won't mention who, have actually done that, right? But not the Catholic theologian, you know, right? So we work within the dogma, the deposit of faith, so that we don't steer off uh, where uh, we don't steer off the teachings, at least what is given to us in the deposit of faith, right? So then the teachings of the Trinity, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, that is the dogma of the church. The teaching of Mary, right? Uh, we have the teaching of Mary because it tells us something about the identity of Jesus, right? That is why we, we have uh, we have this dogma that Mary is conceived without sin. Immaculate conception. Okay. So, uh, five minutes to your break. Uh, I'd like you to reflect on these questions and maybe when we come back, we can just briefly uh, reflect on this. Uh, but go for your break. Uh, can you see this screen? Oh wait, sorry, sorry. Uh, I think you can't see. Let me let me share it with you all. Oops. Oh wait, uh. okay. Sorry, wait, uh, wait, hold on, uh, let me try this again. Uh, 
All right. Uh, explain the role of the covenant in with Israel in preparing the world for the coming of Christ. What does this history tell us about God's relationship with his people? I, I covered a little bit of that. And then I thought it is interesting for us to briefly look as we before we move deeper to the next subject about how does the Holy Spirit work in the church, uh, how the, the Holy Spirit work in the process of revelation and the understanding of it by the church. Also distinguish between public revelation and private revelations as described in the CCC. Maybe you can also share uh, what do you think are the private revelations of today? So if this is okay, uh, Dr. Stephen, can we go for a break?